Hi. <laughs> yes. A um, few weeks ago, uh, we had a gathering together and we talked about decision making. If you, those of you who were here, if you recall, the title of the talk was Decisions, Decisions, Decisions. Because we constantly have to make decisions. And at that time, we talked about different ways that people make decisions. To summarize, there are fundamentally three ways that people make decisions. The first and the most common way of decision making in human history is uh, the authoritarian method of decision making. The authoritarian method is based on power. A person in power says to other people that we are going to do this or that. And if uh, the subjects disagree, they are going to be punished. Parents have done that to children. Kings and rulers do it to their people. And army generals do it to soldiers. Uh, bosses at the uh, place of work demand uh, in an authoritarian way uh, for people to do decisions, things that they decide. It is very, very, very common in human history. And if you look around the world today, you will see there are many governments and many leaders around the world that are making decisions simply because they have power. And they don't listen to other people. And, uh, you know, they say, what I decide is right. And, uh, and this, of course, has been uh, the most destructive form of decision making in human history. It has happened in the families, usually men demanding obedience from women, but also women are doing a good job now demanding obedience from men. Uh, you know. And uh, so it has happened between nations and in different places. The second category of decision are adversarial types of decision making. Decision making that is based on power struggle. In other words, different groups of people or different individuals become engaged in a power struggle which then eventually one of them wins and the other one loses or both of them lose, which is quite often. And uh, this, again, we see it in the families, we see it in the places of work, uh, we see it in uh, between nations, between religions, in political parties, for example, right now, we see the adversarial type of decision-making um, in the United, in United States about choosing their president, or we see it in uh, uh, Quebec in choosing their premier, or we see it at the United Nations. Uh, United Nations is very interesting because it's a combination of authoritarian and adversarial decision-making. Uh, for example, um, the uh, Security Council, uh, when, you know, those six nations that have the veto power, they, they simply make decisions based on power that they have, the veto power, which is authoritarian. 
or they get engaged in discussions and they cannot reach to any conclusions and decisions, uh, which is adversarial. And this process is the most common type of decision making right now, uh, in, you know, side by side with the authoritarian types of decision making. So there are these two types of decision making that right now we see very broadly in our world. Authoritarian, power-based, and adversarial, power struggle-based or competition-based. These are the kind of decision making processes that are happening. Now, as you know, humanity evolves and develops and development of humanity is on the basis of our consciousness, of our understanding, of our insight, the way that we understand ourselves and our world and each other. And, and each, at each level of development, one type of decision making is most common. For example, at the level of childhood, the authoritarian type of decision making is very common. And when humanity was collectively going through its stages of childhood, it made sense that somebody eventually becomes the king and the emperor and the shadow of God and all of those things in order to control the masses, you see. And they did control the masses and they punished and they uh, used force and power to control people. And, and of course, that was also men controlling women, parents controlling their children, religious leaders com- controlling their uh, members of their church and their religious groups. These have been going on for a long time, and those who had uh, money controlling uh, their workers and so forth. Then the adversarial type of decision-making, the competitive type, belongs to the level of adolescence of humanity, adolescent mindset. It is during adolescence that people become engaged in extreme levels of competition and power struggle and who is going to win and who is going to lose. And the world of humanity now is in the final stages of its collective adolescence. And that's why we see so much adolescent behavior in the world that we see everywhere. It's amazing the adolescent mentality that controls the affairs of humanity at the highest level to the level that it, with the children. Even the programs for the children, if you look at them, you will see they are based on adversarial relationship and competition. So children are pushed to become adolescents and adults are forced to remain adolescent, not to grow up. You see, this is, this is the condition that we live right now from a psychological and sociological and even from moral ethical principles because many of these societies consider competition to be a virtue, for example. You see, individualism to be a virtue, you see, because these are characteristics of ethical standards of adolescent age, adolescent mentality. Now, Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, who gave his mission to humanity in uh, a period uh, in 1886 and 7, 8, 9, 90 to 1890s and so forth, during that era, 
at the end of uh, 19th century. Baha'u'llah said that a new era is starting in the life of humanity, collective life of humanity. And this era is the era of coming of age of humanity. In other words, finally humanity is going to move from its collective childhood and collective adolescence to adulthood. That we have therefore to learn the ways of maturity. We have to learn how to relate to each other in mature ways. And he said there are ex- there are a number of issues that are, are characteristics of age of maturation of humanity. S- among them are the following, he said. One, that all humanity is equal. Human, pe- human, human beings are equal beings in terms of their value and worth and and opportunities that they should have. Men and women are equal. He said this is the age of equality, of gender equality of men and women. He said this is the age in which the prejudices of race, of religion, of uh, ethnic background, all of these have to give their way to the the era of mutuality and mutual acceptance and love for each other and respect for each other. This is a new era. And, And he said also this is the era in which human beings can make decisions for themselves. And they don't need to have priests and clergies to control their lives and tell them what is right and what is wrong. Every human being can do that. And we should be able to live, therefore, free from oppression of religious leaders. He also said that the affairs of humanity the political structure of society has to change. And it has to move away both from the authoritarian ways of doing things and from adversarial ways of things and begin to work in such a manner that a civilization of peace will be established. He said that peace has been something that humanity always had wanted. However, never has been able to achieve it because peace is characteristic of a mature society. And therefore, this is the time for us to work on to to create a civilization of peace. And then on the basis of this, he said that the fundamental tool for this purpose is the tool of consultation. He said consultation is the main tool for people and governments and organizations and institutions to relate to each other to make decisions with each other together and to resolve conflicts in a peaceful way. And and therefore, the notion of Baha'i consultation, the idea of Baha'i consultation became the main vehicle for community building and for resolution of conflicts, and for making decisions within the Baha'i community. 
Now, consultation has been practiced by Baha'is for over 100 years. And it has been practiced in all over the world. And it is a, it is a practice that is at once simple and difficult. Consultation, when you read about it, sounds simple. But Baha'is in this group know how difficult it is. How difficult it is to consult together, to make decisions together in a mature way. So what I'm going to share with you is some thoughts about Baha'i consultation which are drawn from this in chapter 9 of my book, Unity of Faith and Reason in Action. Wouldn't be able to cover every aspect of it, but at least we can you know, focus on few of the main components of it. Before doing that, just, I want to read you one quotations from Baha'i writings as a guide to our discussions. Uh, there are many, many statements in Baha'i writings. Some of them are in this chapter, but I do not want to uh, spend time to go over quotations after quotations, but rather to share with you my understanding of uh, all of these to put together, and then we would, of course, can discuss them more. Baha'u'llah says, the heaven of divine wisdom is illumined with two luminaries of consultation and compassion. Take ye counsel together in all matters. In as much as consultation is the lamp of guidance which leadeth the way and is the bestower of understanding. Practically, the whole time tonight that we discuss is going to be about elements of this statement and few other statements. In, a, in order to summarize the issue and make it rather easy to follow, I'm, my talk is going to be kind of a, like a PowerPoint, okay, without the visuals. <laughs> <laughs> so you visualize it. I PowerPoint, and is it, it is all, uh, you know, up there. And you visualize it. Okay. Uh, as I said, Baha'i consultation is the instrument for creating a civilization of peace. And uh, is at the core of it a unity-based method of human deliberation. It is not power-based, authoritarian. It is not adversarial, competition-based. But it is unity-based. And... It means that if you ask what are the goals of consultation, the goal of consultation is to find equitable, just, and constructive solutions. Equitable, just, and constructive solutions to the questions and conflicts at hand. Whenever we have a question before us, whenever we have to make a decision, the one of the most fundamental objective that we have to have in mind in Baha'i consultation is that 
it has to focus on justice. The world of humanity never has experienced justice in administration of its affairs. The majority of humanity complain of injustice. Majority of us experience injustice. The quest of humanity is justice, and therefore it's not surprising that the Baha'i administration, the whole Baha'i administration, is based on elected houses of justice at the local level, national level, and international level. And the purpose of Baha'i consultation is to reach a just decision within the framework of unity and taking into consideration the welfare of all people who will be directly or indirectly affected by the decision. So the decision has to be just, it has to be unifying, and it has to take the welfare of everybody in consideration, into account. Okay. So, so as such, the Baha'i consultation is not two sides or three sides trying to reach a compromise. It is not a compromise. It is not saying this is your idea and this is your idea. Let us to find something that we both agree or partially agree. It is actually people getting together, trying to find a just solution. And you cannot find a just solution unless your deliberations are based on search for truth. In other words, if you do not search for truth in your discussions, then you will not be able to make a just decision. And you will not be able to create unity because when the truth is not there, Unity cannot be there. Okay? So truth, unity, justice, and compassion have to be together in order for Baha'i consultation to take place. These are the essential elements. So if you would to, to say what is the methodology of Baha'i consultation, we say that consultation is a process of collective search for truth within the framework of unity with the purpose of administering justice in an atmosphere of Equality, compassion, freedom from prejudice, and purity of intent. You see how difficult it becomes? You see how difficult it is to make a decision because you have to have purity of motive. What is a purity of motive? Think about the times that you are trying to make a decision with some other people. You will remember, you will realize that in those times, most of the time, people have a hidden agenda. There is a spoken agenda, obvious agenda, that say, yeah, we all want to work together and reach an agreement. And there's a hidden agenda is, I want to make sure that I win. Okay? <laughs> so, you see... And one of the prerequisites of Baha'i consultation is that we have to have purity of motive, meaning we shouldn't have hidden agendas. 
what we say and what we feel within ourselves should be the same. And our objective should be the same. Purity of motive. The other issue is that many times people reach an agreement with each other, but that agreement can be injurious to another people, to other group of people. In other words, if we are prejudiced about certain group of people or don't care about them or we are not compassionate with them, then we are going to make decisions that are good for us but not for them. And that happens constantly. Constantly that happens. So so as you see, the process of decision making, the Baha'i consultation, requires certain fundamental spiritual qualities. Okay? And spiritual principles, therefore, have to be taken into account. In other words, Baha'i consultation is not just a a political decision-making process or a a just... uh, skill that you have. The Baha'i consultation has certain spiritual principles. And the spiritual principles, um, when we read the writings of the Baha'i faith about consultation, can be identified under the following uh, groups, love, the the decision-making should be based on loving relationships. And here we are talking about universal love, unconditional love. We are talking about we becoming the lovers of humanity, lovers of truth, lovers of justice. We are becoming lovers of all that is good, okay? Second, it has to be based on unity, love and unity. The other group of spiritual principles are truth and truthfulness. When we are involved in a consultative process, we have to seek truth and we have to be truthful as individuals. What we say has to be truthful. And that's one of the most difficult things to do because when you want to be truthful in a consultation, sometimes you have to say things that may be difficult for others to hear. In other words, you have to be frank. You have to be open. Okay? If somebody says something to you that uh, you don't feel, you know, if somebody says right now, you know, it is very cold and it's snowing outside and you are in the middle of a summer and it is warm, you have to have the courage and capacity to say, no, actually, it is warm and you are, you are not correct in that respect. Okay. And the person said, but I sincerely believe that it is cold outside. And yes, you are, that's true, but you are sincerely wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, because, uh, you know, truth is truth. And, you know, you have to be able to deal with that principle of frankness in a manner that you maintain unity. But at the same time, you are frank. And this combination is difficult. To be frank and to be unifying at the same time. And to be loving at the same time. And that requires a lot of maturity on our part. So the spiritual principles, love and unity, truth and truthfulness, and then service and justice. Service and justice are related to our will. We, we, our capacity to make decisions, our willpower. The human willpower 
there are two areas that you can use it the best is one at the interpersonal level to serve each other, to be of service to each other, and at the decision-making institutional level to seek justice. Okay? So service and justice go together. Truth and truthfulness is related to our intellectual capacities, our capacity to know, and also have to go together. And, and of course, love and unity is related to our capacity to love. Okay, so, so these are the spiritual aspects of decision making. Now, we want to talk briefly about different stages of decision making. Okay. Of consultation. Think of Baha'i consultation as a sandwich. Okay? Think of it as a sandwich. A sandwich has three parts. The bottom part of the bun, the top, and in the middle a lot of stuff that you put in the middle. Right? Okay. Think of the sandwich. What is at the bottom and at the top is unity. In other words, Baha'i consultation should start with unity. You have to have a unity of purpose. When people come together to make decisions and to resolve conflict, usually they come in a state of disunity. Usually they come because they are in disagreement with each other. In the Baha'i consultation, is exactly the opposite. You actually have to enter in consultation in a unity of purpose. What is that? It means that you prepare yourself, that I am going into this consultative process with the objective of searching for truth in order that we can together find the truth, together we can make a just decision, and together we can implement that decision. Okay? You have to prepare yourself to go into the decision-making process, into consultation, in that way of thinking. And if eight of us or nine of us are going to go together, all of us should prepare ourselves before we come to the consultative process that we are coming in this manner, with this attitude, with this objective. And therefore, we are coming together united in a state of unity. Okay? Because if we don't do that, then Baha'i consultation doesn't take place. Is the first step, the first foundation, the foundation upon which you're going to make the sandwich is the bond of unity that you put down there. Okay? This is there. Otherwise, your sandwich is going to, you know, break up. And it's, it's not going to happen. Okay? Now, no, no nurturing of soul is going to take place. Okay? So, so the first you come with unity of purpose, of objective, that you all know. And because usually it is difficult to remember everything, in the Baha'i consultation process, at the beginning, you say cert- certain prayers. You pray together that you will be guided to be united to seek truth in order to make just decisions and in order to be of compassion and constructive action to everybody. Okay? You pray 
that this is what you're going to do. You prepare yourself and you pray together that you're going to do that. That's the first part. So, after you do that, which means you are preparing yourself as individuals, then you have to prepare yourself as a group. As a group, in two ways. One, of course, your objectives of to go about consultation. But secondly, you have to prepare as a group what are the facts of the issue that you want to consult on. Any issue that comes before the consultation process in the family, in the assembly, in the institutions, in society, in government, always there are two set of principles that you have to consider. First, you, the, as a group, you have to ask what are the spiritual principles involved in this case. Every case, every issue has factual principles, facts, facts of the matter. <coughs> they have scientific principles that apply and there are spiritual principles that apply. Now, the facts are usually very difficult because if you are, especially if you are involved in a conflict, people become, come from different aspects, from different sides of the story, right? And this is why one of the fundamental challenges of consultation about fact-finding is that you have to detach yourself from your fact. What does it mean? It means that how you do that, how you, you detach yourself from the fact of your uh, knowledge, okay, that you know, is that you, you express the fact as you understand it, the best way you understand it. You express it and you put it on the table, on the consultation table. And once you put it on the consultation table, it no longer belongs to you, belongs to the group. Okay? Another was, you know, you say, we, okay, we, you know, we have been called upon to talk about what is the best way to educate children. And uh, I come and say that the best way to educate children is to punish them every time that they make some mistakes. That's my fact. So I put my idea there. And somebody can ask me, why you say that? And say, because look how great I am. My father always punished me. So it worked. So if it worked with my father and I, therefore it's going to work with me and my child. Okay? And that's why I do it. Okay? So that's my fact. I put it there. Okay? And somebody else would come and say, no, in order to make sure that the children are educated the best way possible, we have to be encouraging, we have to be loving, you have to be kind, we shouldn't do uh, harsh things to them, and so forth. So so all of these facts that people have, in other words, different opinions that people have, different information that people have, different ideas that people have, they are all put together in the middle. They no longer belong to a person. They belong to the group. Then the group says, okay, now let's look at this. And in the light of two sets of principles, First, let us see what are the principles that apply, spiritual principles that apply to education of children, for example, and what are the current psychological and educational and pedagogical 
facts that we have, scientific facts that apply to education of children. You see, you have first put all of the information that we all had together in the middle. Then you say, what are the spiritual facts that apply here? Principle, spiritual principles that apply to these facts. And what are the scientific principles that apply to this fact? And if we don't know the scientific principles, then we call upon experts in the field to help us. So we bring a teacher and say, tell us what are the latest theories and scientific knowledge about education of children. You bring a psychologist, bring a teacher, bring a sociologist, bring all people who are involved in education. If we don't know the spiritual principles, we go into the holy writings and the writings and to see what are the spiritual principles enunciated about this. What are ethical principles? What are the, uh, the moral principles that apply here? So, so when you do that, no longer whatever we knew at the beginning that we thought it was a fact for us, no longer that holds because now you have gone through a process of looking at the same issues through different ways of the different prisms and new knowledge has emerged. And with this new knowledge now, now you can actually decide what are the facts of the matter before you and what are the best decisions to make. And, and then you ask yourself, okay, let us make decisions that are just, that are conducive to unity, that are compassionate, and they are all-inclusive, universal. You see, these are essential aspects of that decision. So, the sandwich, now these are the stuff goes in the middle, you know, in the, you know, all kind of things that you put in the middle of the sandwich. Your discussions, your facts that you bring in, the search of spiritual principles that you do, the search of scientific principles that you do, consultation with the experts that you do, all of those things go in the middle. But then you have to make a decision now together how to proceed. And that's the top. Uh, part of the sandwich. And the top part is that you make decision, hopefully your decision would be unanimous. Mm -hmm. Meaning you all agree. You have a unity of thought. You started with unity of purpose and you end with unity of thought. Okay? You all agree. And if for whatever reason, we are, you have to go to majority as soon as the majority decides. The others have to, will accept that decision as their own decision and make it unanimous. In other words, in the Baha'i consultation, you don't have abstentions. Somebody <laughs> cannot say, we, you know, we are not going to make a decision. I'm neither for that or or against or for, nor you have a ma majority decision and minority decision that the Supreme Court has, okay? Supreme Court usually has a majority decision, minority. No. In the Baha'i faith, when the majority decides something, everybody agrees. Everybody agrees. So it becomes unanimous. So you, you see the unity that you create has to have Several components. Unity of thought. Then a decision always, a consultation always is complete when that decision is implemented. 
So you have to have a unity of thought and a unity of action. In other words, together you have to make sure that what you have decided is going to be put into practice. You know, you, you know that, that so many good decisions are made that they never are put into action. Right? You make decisions to yourself that you never put it into practice. You make decisions as husbands and wives and parents and children, never put it into practice. You make decisions as institutions and never it works. Or you just ask one person to do it without having a <coughs> united uh, uh, effort to make sure that it, it happens. And therefore, so many good ideas are wasted. They go. They go and become nothing and create disappointment. It creates discouragement. It creates people to lose faith of trust that things would work. It, it creates so many difficulties because of that. Okay. So the process of Baha'i consultation requires that at the end of the uh, pro, uh, procedure of decision making, that we have a unity of thought, a unity of action. And there is a third, third component. And the third component is the evaluation of the results of that decision. In other words, we always have to learn from our decisions. Because not all decisions are perfect. And not all of them work. And some of them fail. And we, instead of saying, yeah, it shows you, you should have gone with my views rather than your views, we should have the attitude that say, okay, we have made the decision together to the best of our ability. We looked at the fact, to the best of facts, the best of ability, the principles to the best of ability, make the decision to the best of ability, try to implement it to the best of ability, and we have to see what was the outcome and to learn from the outcome. If it was positive, we learned one thing. If it was not positive, we learn another thing. But we learn. And this adds to our unity and to our knowledge. So the whole process, therefore, becomes a peaceful process of decision-making rather than a conflict-based decision-making. Now, as you see, therefore, in the Baha'i consultation process, we really have to approach the issues before us as scientists. In other words, we have to apply the scientific principles of search for truth, of detachment from our ideas, of openness of mind, of willingness to learn new things, of changing of our minds until we finally reach a decision that, you know, all agree. Now, one of the most difficult things about decision-making is the maintenance of unity. And that is one of the things that every member of the decision-making body should learn how to uh, bring into the decision process. And in order, you know, when you start consultation, of course we don't have unity of uh, uh, complete unity about that issue because we have to reach to level of unity. So 
what you do, you start with a small circle of unity. The small circle of unity is unity of purpose. We all agree that we are going to go about this issue within the framework of a high consultation. Okay? That's the first circle of unity. Then as the discussion goes on, every time that we see another area of unity, however small, we should, the, in consultation, we should remind ourselves, say, okay, we have reached another level of unity. A new dimension of unity has reached. Okay? So you constantly add to this circle of unity. You make circle of unity bigger and bigger and bigger. You see, that's the whole idea. So usually the best chairs in the Baha'i consultation are those who can identify this emergent unity. You know, the chair who says, I see that there is a point of unity, a new point of unity emerging. And and describing it, and when people say, yeah, yes, you add to it, you see. And you may agree about uh, the facts, you may agree about what had happened, you may agree about the spiritual principle, about the scientific principle, whatever we agree, you add to it. In other words, you have to constantly enlarge the circle of unity. And this is the duty of everybody but particularly the person who is at that time chairing and and conducting the, the the task of the consultation process. So, to summarize, the Baha'i Baha consultation is the process of search for truth in order to reach just decisions that are conducive to unity, maintain and increase the unity of all involved. And the decision is of positive nature and quality for all people directly or indirectly involved. So when we keep those in mind, and then we keep the, the, the fundamental essential element of unity, of spiritual principles, of scientific principles, of scientific uh, attitude, detachment, objectivity, search for truth, open-mindedness, open-heartedness, no hidden agenda, no prejudice, universality. When you put all of those together, then you are engaged in rather good by consultation. Let's have a little discussion. Yes. Well, the question is how do you engage individuals or institutions who are not members of the Baha'i faith in the act of consultation. Uh, many years ago, in Canada, there was a considerable degree of uh, discussion nationally about uh, whether we should have atomic energy in Canada or we should abolish ab atomic energy in Canada. There was a heated, heated discussion, if you recall. That, that time I was living in New York, in uh, Toronto. And in certain time in Toronto, they, the 
the two groups were a such degree of antagonistic attitude toward each other that they were not willing to go in the same place and talk it over. And somebody had heard that Baha'is uh, are good at uh, creating, uh, uh, you know, unified decision-making. So they came to us and said, can you help? Uh, they said, we don't have any money to give you, but we can give you some uh, dinner or lunch, uh, if you want. Sandwich. Which was... Sandwich, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Which was very good idea. Okay. So, so we said, okay, let us see what we can do. And there were two of us involved, myself and one other person. And we went to one group and said, please tell us what is the fundamental reason that you are for atomic energy? And they said, well, the fundamental reason is that uh, we live in Canada. Canada is cold. Winters are harsh. Uh, the condition of energy and so forth, or especially the oil-based energy, is not all that sure. It is important to have other sources of energy that our children and grandchildren don't uh, freeze to death. They continue to live in this land. We are concerned about future. We said, okay. We said another lunch. We went to the other group and asked the same question. Said, what is your fundamental reason? And they said, atomic energy is dangerous. It can have an accident. It can, you know, cause all kinds of problems for not only us, for our children and grandchildren. So we went back to the other group and said, good news. So what's the good news? And said that they agree their fundamental reason is identical with your fundamental reason. They said, how could it be? We said, that's the case. And he said, well, because your you are united in your fundamental reason of what is important. Wouldn't be that a good idea to sit together and see what you can do about your children and grandchildren? Okay? It's not, it's not about who is going to win, who is going to lose. It's about what is the best thing to do for our children and grandchildren. To our surprise and delight, they agreed. And they came together and start talking. You see, what we did, we found a point of unity. Mm -hmm. If as soon as you find a point of unity, you know, the, you know, I, you know, in my practice, I used to, I used to have an office, you know, about the size of this room. And uh, there were uh, a three sitters like that, a love seat. That this was a practice for uh, couples, you know, and couple of uh, chairs, independent chairs that were on rollers that they turned. Okay, so when when couple come for consultation. I 